Welcome to yet another all-time greatest NBA players list. But this is according to me, Christian Myers. I am the author of the all-time greatest NBA book series. I've written two books that contain the 50 greatest teams, the 50 greatest playoff runs, the 50 greatest playoff moments, the 100 greatest players, and the 300 greatest regular seasons by a player. So making these kind of lists is what I do for a living. I spent years researching the history of the league before I took on the project of writing those books. And now I have a platform where I can share this with you all. Everyone has their own list and their own criteria. But for me, I'll make it very simple. I value the way a player performed during their prime and in the playoffs over longevity. For example, I will have Bill Walton ranked over Chris Bosh because of how great he was at his peak. But if you can have both, then you have a very good chance of being ranked high. Since we're talking about 100 players, I won't spend much time speaking about these players, but I will mention a few things that swayed me to place each player at their particular ranking. And I welcome everyone to give their take on the ranking and the players. Let's begin. Number 100, we have Draymond Green. He's the closest thing to Dennis Rodman. The value that he brings to the Warriors goes way beyond the box score. He was a top tier defender and the Defensive Player of the Year award is proof of how great he was at the defensive end. Then on the other side, he helped initiate the Warriors' revolutionary offense. I think it's fair to say that Golden State doesn't win four titles without him. Number 99, we have Tom Heinsohn. The eight championships that he won while playing for the Boston Celtics are the biggest reason why he's here. But most importantly, he was their best scoring option before Sam Jones took on a bigger role in the offense. In fact, he was their leading scorer in three of the eight final series the Celtics won. Number 98, we have Chris Bosh. His longevity is the most impressive part. He played at an all-star level for over a decade, which includes the time when he needed to reinvent his game with the Miami Heat. He was an all-star for those four years he played with the big three. That helps us see how important he was for the two titles the Heat won. Number 97, we have Chauncey Billups. He's the most underrated floor general of the 21st century. Not only did he win finals MVP, but he led his team to 50 plus wins for eight straight seasons. And from 2003 to 2009, his team either went to the conference finals or the finals. Then there's the fact that he ranks eighth all time in win shares among all point guards. Number 96, we have Ben Wallace. He's arguably the greatest defensive player of the modern era. He won four defensive player of the year awards in five years. He's the only player to accomplish that feat. The 2004 season is the greatest example of that. He posted the highest offensive win shares and defensive rating since the merger. And in the playoffs, he posted the highest offensive win shares ever. I believe he was the most valuable player of that championship team. Number 95, we have Dikembe Mutombo. He also won four defensive player of the year awards and he's second all time in career blocks. But he was more than just a shot blocker. Everywhere he went, he always made his team significantly better. Even at 34 years old, he played an important role in the Sixers reaching the finals. Number 94, we have Grant Hill. He was arguably the best all around player in the 90s. He had 29 triple doubles between the 1994-95 season to the 1999 lockout season. That is the most out of any player from that decade. And players such as Scottie Pippen had a five-year head start. Imagine what he could have done in the 2000s if it wasn't for injuries. Number 93, we have Alonzo Mourning. Check out this impressive stretch from 1997 to 2000. He won the Defensive Player of the Year award twice. He led the league in blocks twice. He was selected to the All-NBA First Team ahead of Shaq in 1999. He was selected to the All-NBA First Team defense twice and the Miami Heat either had the best or second best record in the East. That's how great his prime was. Number 92, we have Nate Thurmond. The numbers might not love him, but his contemporaries do. Kareem said that he played him better than anybody ever has. In fact, in their 1973 semifinals matchup, he held the MVP to 42.8% shooting for the series. Then Will Chamberlain called him an incredible defensive player who played him as well as Bill Russell. That's all that needs to be said about how great of a defensive player he was. Number 91, we have Chris Mullen. 
he's in the running for the best volume shooter of the 90s along with Reggie Miller. Reggie might have had a better career, but Chris had a higher peak. There were two straight seasons where he averaged over 25 points per game and shot north of 53% from the field. Michael Jordan is the only backcourt player that posted those numbers throughout that whole decade. Number 90, we have Artis Gilmore. Personally, I don't count what some of the players accomplished while playing in the ABA. He was a beast in the ABA, and he was great in the NBA. He was automatic from the field. In fact, he still has the second and third highest field goal percentage for a single season while averaging over 10 field goal attempts. And he played a big role in the Spurs reaching the conference finals in 1983. Number 89, we have Billy Cunningham. He was an important player for the 1967 Philadelphia 76ers, which is widely considered one of the greatest teams ever. Then when Wilt left to play for the Lakers, he made three All-NBA first team selections and one second team. In fact, he was only the sixth player to average over 20 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists prior to the merger. Number 88, we have Jason Tatum. He led his team to the finals. There were three years where he led his team to the conference finals, which includes two times where he was one game away from reaching the finals. He has two All-NBA first team selections. He has an Eastern Conference Finals MVP trophy, and he scored 51 points in a Game 7. His resume is already pretty stacked. Number 87, we have Pete Maravich. Pistol Pete hasn't played since 1980, and we still haven't had a player do the things he could do. He was a showman, a true artist of the game. He was way ahead of his time. His former teammate, Lou Hudson, even called him the greatest player if we just look at his raw talents in 1977. If only he didn't have such bad luck with injuries and playing for an expansion team during his prime years, he would be ranked much higher. Number 86, we have Luka Doncic. I call him the David Copperfield of the NBA. His offensive skill set is up there with the legends of the game. He already has three All-NBA first team selections, two top five finishes in MVP voting, and one trip to the conference finals. Oh, and he's the only player to ever record over 60 points, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists in a game. Not even this guy has ever done that. Number 85, we have Kyrie Irving. If we're talking skill for skill, he's one of the greatest individual talents we have ever seen. And he put all that talent to good use in his legendary 2016 playoff run. That includes when he made what is known as the most clutch shot in NBA history in Game 7 that brought a title home to Cleveland. At number 84, we have Paul Arizon. And at number 83, we have George Mikan. Those are two of the best players of the 50s. This is my way of respecting those legends. However, I don't have that much respect for the players that came in the pre-shot clock era. That is why I have them pretty low on this list. Number 82, we have Bob Lanier. He is a Detroit Pistons legend that excelled in an era with a lot of great big men. His signature shot was his left hook, but he also had a great outside shot. And they say that he was one of the biggest and baddest enforcers in the league. He truly had a complete game. Number 81, we have Chris Webber. The late 90s and early 2000s were the toughest era for power forwards, and C. Webb excelled. Other than Kevin Garnett, he was the best all-around big man. When he was with the Sacramento Kings, he was the best player for a team that won over 50 games for four straight seasons. That includes the 2002 season when he could have very easily added a title and finals MVP to his resume if it wasn't for outside circumstances. Number 80, we have Jimmy Butler. Let me show you my nerdy side for a second. He currently ranks 5th all time in career offensive rating, 23rd in win chairs per 48 minutes, 43rd in value over replacement player rating, 47th in PER, and 50th in offensive win chairs. The numbers tell us he has always been extremely valuable to all the teams he's played for. It's no wonder he has led his team to the finals twice in the past 4 years. Number 79, we have Klay Thompson. Put this man on the list of most feared players when they're filling it, because he goes to video game mode when he's hot. Like when he scored 60 points in 29 minutes, or when he scored 37 points in one quarter. But he's also done it when it really matters. 
like when he scored his playoff career high of 41 points in that infamous Game 6 against OKC. Or the fact that he still tied with the most three-pointers made for a single playoff run. Number 78, we have Tony Parker. Here's how we know he was extremely valuable to the Spurs. He won the Finals MVP in 2007, and he was 5th in MVP voting in 2013. For that season, he was the only 20 points per game scorer for a team that was oh so close to winning a title. He was so important during this era when Duncan was no longer the focal point of the offense. Number 77, we have Mano Ginobili. There are two legendary players he has been linked to. He's been compared to Pete Maravich for his craftiness and John Havlicek for his ability to bring so much value while coming off the bench. The best example of that came in the 2005 playoffs. He currently has the 32nd highest win shares and the 33rd highest value over replacement player rating for a single play. Number 76, we have Joe Dumars. He's one of the best two-way players of his time. Michael Jordan even said that no one guarded him better. Then in the 1989 finals, he won finals MVP while averaging 27.3 points per game on nearly 58% shooting and 6 assists per game. We should not take lightly that he won such an important award for a team that is considered one of the 5 or 10 greatest teams ever. Now we've reached the top 75. At number 75, we have Sidney Moncrief. He's the only two guard with multiple Defensive Player of the Year trophies. In fact, he's the first player to ever win that award. He was the best player for a Milwaukee Bucks team that won over 50 games for six straight years. During that span, they reached the conference finals three times and he was fourth in MVP voting in 1984. Number 74, we have Vince Carter. His athletic ability was jaw-dropping. His longevity was even more impressive. He's only one of 23 players that have scored over 25,000 points in their career. He's also 7th all-time in career three-pointers made. He may be ranked too low in the eyes of many, but the reasoning behind it is that he was selected to the All-NBA twice and he failed to reach the playoffs a total of 5 times for the first 10 years of his career. Number 73, we have Alex English. Scoring is what he did best, and the numbers say he was one of the best to do it in the 80s. He scored the most points of any player during that decade. An interesting stat is that he is one of 12 non-centers to average over 25 points while shooting north of 55% from the field for a season. He also led the Nuggets to the Conference Finals in 1985. Number 72, we have Tiny Archibald. His greatest individual accomplishment is that he is the only player to finish first in scoring and assist for a season. That came in his legendary 1973 season. He is also the only player to be in the top 25 all-time for the most points and assists tallied for a single season. Then in 1981, he played a big role in the Celtics winning their first title of the Larry Bird era. He was even an all-star that year. Number 71, we have Damian Lillard. Did you know that he has more combined All-NBA first and second team appearances than Isaiah Thomas and Clyde Trexler? He also has the same number as Walt Frazier, Elvin Hayes, and Carmelo Anthony. He will soon be in the top five in career three-pointers made, and he also has the third most 60-point games. He even has more than Michael Jordan himself. But he was more than just a scorer, as he led the Blazers to the Conference Finals in 2019. Number 70, we have Carmelo Anthony. He might have been the best scorer of his era, but nobody was as smooth as Melo. He was a walking bucket, which explains why he's ninth all time in points scored. That just speaks to his remarkable longevity. And when he had the pieces to contend, he led the Denver Nuggets to the Conference Finals in 2009. Number 69, we have Dennis Johnson. He has three titles, one Finals MVP, and one top five finish in MVP voting. He was also the floor general for arguably the greatest team in NBA history, the 1986 Boston Celtics. Magic Johnson even called him the best backcourt defender of all time. That explains why he has the third most all-NBA first team defense selections from a point guard. We're talking about one of the most underrated players ever. Number 68, we have Pau Gasol. He's one of the few players to have over 20,000 points and 10,000 rebounds. He currently ranks 
29th all-time in win shares and value of replacement player rating, 30th in offensive win shares, 39th in defensive win shares, and 51st in PER. He has been extremely valuable to all the teams he has played for. It's no surprise that once he arrived to the Lakers, they went to the finals three years in a row and won two titles. Number 67, we have Robert Parrish. Longevity is what you think of when talking about the Chief. He still holds the record for the most games played in the NBA. But what's even more impressive is that he maintained the same level of play for so long. Take for example his first playoff series as a member of the Celtics. He averaged 17 points and 8.5 rebounds at the age of 27. In his last playoff series, at the age of 39, he averaged 17 points and 9.5 rebounds against Alonzo Mourning and the Hornets. Talk about sustained excellence. Number 66, we have Hal Greer. The word to describe this player is consistency. He was an all-star for 10 straight years, and he was the leading scorer for the legendary 1967 Sixers team. He was a top three shooting guard for the 60s era behind Jerry West and Sam Jones. Number 65, we have Bernard King. This is an example of how much I value the peak of this remarkable player. The perfect example of his greatness came in the 1984 playoffs. He averaged 42.6 points on 60% shooting in the first round. He's only one of five players that have averaged over 40 points in a playoff series. And this was done against the Detroit Pistons. Then he nearly beat Larry Bird and the Celtics in the next round as his series went to seven games. Imagine what he could have done if his prime wasn't cut short due to injuries. Number 64, we have Tracy McGrady. His prime was as good as any player ever. Both Kobe Bryant and Paul Pierce have publicly stated that he was the toughest player they've had to guard. In 2003, he became only the fifth player to average over 32 points, 6 rebounds, and 5 assists in a season. He would have easily won the MVP if his team wasn't in shambles. Number 63, we have Adrian Dantley. He is arguably the most efficient scorer in NBA history. He not only averaged over 30 points for 3 straight seasons, but he also shot over 55% each time. Only Kareem has been able to accomplish that. Other than those two, only Giannis and Karl Malone has been able to post those numbers for just one season. Then when he got traded to the Pistons, he was so close to being the leading scorer for a championship winning team. But outside circumstances stopped this from happening. Number 62, we have Dennis Rodman, the ultimate glue guy the ultimate energy guy, one of the greatest defenders of all time, and my vote for the greatest rebounder ever. But he's also a winner. I'll remind you that the 1989 Pistons and the 1996 Bulls are considered one of the greatest teams ever, and they couldn't do it without him. That can't be a coincidence. Number 61, we have Reggie Miller. The biggest concern is that he's never been selected to the All-NBA first or second team and he's never been voted in the top 10 for the MVP. However, he's currently 6th all-time in career offensive rating, and he ranks higher in career offensive win shares than Kobe, Shaq, and Jerry West. He also led his team to the conference finals 5 times, and he was one game away from reaching the finals 3 times. In 2000, he led the Pacers to the finals. He's not just a great shooter, but he's also a legendary playoff performer. Number 60 we have Ray Allen. He is legendary for the same reasons that make Reggie Miller so great. His advanced metrics aren't as good, but the two titles that he won and making the biggest shot in NBA history are what convinced me to place him over Reggie. Number 59, we have Joel Embiid. The MVP that he won and the second place finish in 2022 make him an automatic lock to be a top 75 player. And his skill set is remarkable for a player his size. It's as good as Hakeem Olajuwon, in my opinion. The one thing that is holding him back is that he has never reached the conference finals. If he can have some playoff success, then he will surely be in the top 50 in no time. Number 58, we have Anthony Davis. I remember reading in some article from ESPN that Anthony Davis is a stat stuffer, not a stat patter. There's a big difference between the two. 
everything he does on both ends of the floor has such a positive impact on the team. When he is healthy, emphasize the word when, his teams have overachieved in the playoffs. When he is healthy, he is quite possibly the greatest skilled player to ever play the power forward position. But half the time, he just can't stay on the court. Number 57, we have Dwight Howard. He might have been the most athletically gifted center since Wilt. He used athleticism to good use on the defensive end, where he had very few weaknesses. The accolades speak for themselves. He won three consecutive Defensive Player of the Year awards. He's the only player to accomplish that feat. He also proved that you could build a team around him. He led the Magic to the Finals in 2009, and he reached the Conference Finals two other times before joining the Lakers. Number 56, we have James Worthy. Magic Johnson once called him one of the top 10 players in playoff history. You certainly know about the Finals MVP and the triple-double performance in Game 7 of the 1988 Finals. But did you know that he averaged 30.5 points on 60% shooting in the 1987 Conference Finals? Or that he averaged 28 points on 64.5% shooting in the 1990 First Round Series? Magic wasn't just hyping up his boy. He was truly an exceptional playoff performer. Number 55, we have Dominique Wilkins. I originally had him in my top 50 in my book, but have since reconsidered. I just couldn't have him over these next four players. But his incredible athletic ability and his remarkable scoring prowess are what put him on the cusp of the top 50. He's currently 14th all time in career points. He averaged more than 25 points for 10 consecutive seasons. He's only one of eight players to accomplish that. He finished second in MVP voting in 1986. And he led the Hawks to win 50 or more games for four consecutive seasons. The only negative part of his resume is that he has never reached the conference finals. Number 54, we have Bob McAdoo. Imagine beating out Kareem and Rick Barry at their peak for the MVP. That's what Bob did in 1975. He averaged 34.5 points. That's the 14th highest mark for a single season. Bill Russell even called him the greatest shooter of all time. Obviously, a lot has changed since then, but the fact that his center was getting that kind of praise was impressive. You can say he played a part in revolutionizing that position. Number 53, we have Dave Cowens. He's one of the very few players that was a star, but played like he was fighting for a spot on the team. He approached every game with playoff intensity. It was something that this six foot nine center needed to bang with the tough big men of the league. And he had great success. He won the MVP in 1973. He led the Celtics to 68 wins that season. And there was a five year stretch where Boston either went to the conference finals or won the title. Number 52, we have Wes Unseld. This was easily the hardest player for me to evaluate. His numbers look Draymond Green-like. Yet all the older fans say without a question that he is one of the all-time greats. After doing my research, I could see why they were saying that. In just his first year, the Baltimore Bullets improved by 21 games. Then they reached the finals the following year. They eventually reached the finals three other times and won the title in 1978. His team never missed the playoffs during the 70s. He just knew how to win and neutralize all the centers of the league. Number 51, we have Bill Walton. There have been many players that had their careers shortened because of injuries. In most cases, we were able to see them at their absolute peak and get a taste of their greatness. Maybe their legacy would have looked better with a longer career, but it didn't affect their place among the all-time greats. There's only a handful of those players where their ceiling was somewhere in the top 20. Bill Walton is one of those players. He had one of the greatest playoff runs in 1977, and he played an important role for the 1986 Boston Celtics. Now we enter the top 50. At number 50, we have Sam Jones. The 10 titles he's won are part of the reason he's considered a top 50 player for me. Then there's the fact that he was the Celtics' best scorer of the Bill Russell era. He's the only player to average over 25 points for a season, and has scored over 50 points in a game. He's also one of the most clutch performers ever. He averaged 30.1 points in 8 deciding Game 7s or deciding Game 5s as a starter. 
that also includes making a game-winning jumper over Wilt in Game 7 of the 1962 Division Series, and he made a buzzer beater in Game 4 of the 1969 Finals that kept their title hopes alive. Number 49, we have George Gervin. He's the best player that has never reached the Finals. That is a good and a bad thing. He was undoubtedly the most unstoppable scorer of his time. He averaged over 33 points in 1980, which is something that only 10 other players have been able to do. He was good enough to carry his team to the conference finals a total of three times, but he could never reach the finals. And he had his opportunities. Number 48, we have Russell Westbrook. The case for him is simple. He's the most statistically imposing player since Wilt. He averaged a triple-double for an entire season, four times. Only Oscar Robertson has been able to accomplish this impressive feat, and he only did it once. The fact that he still stands alone for the modern NBA should be properly compensated. When he was playing alongside Kevin Durant, he reached the finals and there were three other trips to the conference finals. But since KD left, he has gone bounced from the first round five times. Number 47 we have Elvin Hayes. Thanks to his impressive durability and strong offensive and defensive play, he became one of the most accomplished players ever. He's only one of five players that have recorded over 25,000 points and 15,000 rebounds. My biggest concern though is that I found too many of his contemporaries that didn't have a lot of nice things to say about him. He was especially notorious for underperforming in big moments. That's a big red flag for my list. Number 46, we have Kevin McHale. This has more to do with the eye test than the numbers. There are many people who give him the title of the most skilled power forward ever. That was because of his extensive array of low post moves and his versatility on the defense event. He's among six players to average over 20 points while shorting north of 60% for a season. He was also the team's leading scorer in the 1985 and 1986 Finals. In the 1987 Finals, he nearly averaged 60% from the field while playing with a broken foot. That's all that needs to be said of how unstoppable he was. Number 45, we have Paul Pierce. Thanks to his longevity and durability, he was able to have an impressive career resume. But what caught my eye the most was how great he was in the clutch. He's had seven total buzzer beaters which is the fourth most ever. And he's had a multitude of clutch moments in the playoffs. He was great when it counted the most. He wasn't a better talent than players such as Elvin Hayes or George Gervin, but he played much better in the playoffs. Number 44, we have Willis Reed. Check out how impressive his prime was. In a span of five years, he won an MVP. He finished runner-up another year. He won two titles. He won two finals MVPs and he either made the finals or the conference finals. Between 1969 to 1970, he had to face Kareem, Bill Russell, and Wilt in the playoffs. For the 28 total games he played against them, he averaged a combined 25 points on 50% shooting and 14 rebounds. He only lost one series against them, which was to the Celtics. That's how great he was before injuries ended his career. Number 43, we have Gary Payne. He was the first point guard to win the Defensive Player of the Year award. He is tied with Michael Jordan and Kevin Garnett with the record for the most All-NBA defensive first team selections. He even ranks fourth in career steals. His two-way ability was spectacular. He was the best player for a team that won 64 games and reached the finals in 1996. And there were two other seasons when the Sonics won over 60 games. He wasn't always a joy to be around but he did his job to near perfection. Number 42, we have Jason Kidd. His two-way abilities are just as impressive as his rival, except his career resume is slightly better. He's second in career assists and steals. He's fourth all-time in career triple-doubles. As far as his defensive play, he's one of 12 players that have been selected to the All-NBA defensive team nine times. His numbers are great, but the way he can lead a team is the best part of his game. That was demonstrated with the New Jersey Nets. He led this lottery bound team to the finals two years in a row. And then Dirk was finally able to win a title in part to Kidd's exceptional court vision. 
Number 41, we have Clyde Trexler. He is arguably the greatest all-around player from the shooting guard position. He was usually one of the top producing rebounders and playmakers among shooting guards, and he even ranks 8th all-time in steals. But the best part of his resume is that he led the Blazers to the finals twice in a three-year span. Then he played an important role in the Rockets, winning the title in 1995 after joining the team before the trade deadline. Number 40, we have Patrick Ewing. He was a beast on offense before all the knee injuries, and he was a monster on the defensive end. In 1993, he recorded an 8.1 defensive win shares, which is the third highest since the merger. He even ranks 9th all time in career defensive win shares and 7th in career blocks. That played a big part in the Knicks having 7 50 win seasons and 1 60 win season. Throughout the 90s, the Knicks only experienced one first round exit, which included being one game away from winning the title in 1994. Number 39, we have Allen Iverson. He is universally known as the greatest pound for pound player ever. The biggest aspect of his game was the heart he played with. He was the biggest killer every night. Putting the intangibles aside, his scoring is what he did best. He's one of seven players to average over 30 points in four different seasons or more. He's also one of five players to have over four scoring titles. But nothing was more impressive than when he carried the Sixers all the way to the finals in 2001 with no one else averaging over 15 points. Number 38, we have Steve Nash. What made him a top 50 player was the two MVPs he won in consecutive seasons. How valuable was he to his teams? Well, his teams led the league in offensive efficiency for nine straight years. And when he joined the Phoenix Suns, they became only the second team to post a 60 win season following a 50 loss season. For those six years, the Suns reached the conference finals three times and had two 60 win seasons. From an individual standpoint, he is 4th in career assist and 15th all-time in offensive win shares. Number 37, we have Walt Frazier. He's one of the greatest perimeter defenders who mastered the art of thievery. He ranks 3rd for the most All-NBA defensive first team selections with 7. On top of that, he was the team's primary scorer from 1971 to 1975. When the Knicks won their second title in 1973, he was their best player. And when the captain went down in the 1970 finals, it was Clyde that stepped up in game seven. He infamously had 36 points, 19 assists, and seven rebounds. That is only one of the many examples when he came up big in the clutch. Number 36, we have Rick Barry. If he never made that jump to the ABA after leading his team to the finals in 1967, he would have surely been ranked much higher were stripping away five years of his prime. But that doesn't mean he didn't leave his mark on the league. In his second season, he won the scoring title while averaging over 35 points. Then in 1975, he had an incredible all-around season where he averaged over 30 points, six assists, five rebounds, and nearly three steals. Then in the finals, the Warriors swept the Washington Bullets who were heavily favored to win the title. Number 35 we have Kawhi Leonard. He's one of the greatest two-way players ever. I'm talking in the same class as Jordan and Kobe. I mean, players were actively avoiding going ISO on him. That's how great he was on the defensive end. And just like Jordan and Kobe, he's one of the best clutch players of his generation. We saw it time and time again in the 2019 playoffs where he led the Raptors to the title in his first and only year there. What he doesn't have is longevity. He will end up not surpassing 20,000 points for his career. Number 34, we have Bob Cousy. He is the godfather of the modern point guard. He was flashy before flashy was cool. The Boston Celtics were the standard for winning. We all think of Bill Russell's 11 rings, but Bob Cousy was the one player who brought it all together. And that's not just because he was there first, but because he was their main playmaker. Let's not forget that he was a league MVP in 1957. That is a rare accolade to achieve for a point guard, especially in those times. Number 33, we have Bob Pettit. Everyone describes him the same way. He was relentless and a hard-nosed player. What impressed me the most about his career was the way he played against Bill Russell. 
in their head-to-head -head battles, he had two 50-point games and five 40-point games. From 1957 to 1961, he helped the St. Louis Hawks make the finals in four out of those five years. When he won the title in 1958, he scored 50 points in Game 6, which brought Bill Russell his only finals defeat of his career. Number 32, we have James Harden. Is he the best scorer since Michael Jordan? The numbers give him an intriguing case. In 2019, he averaged 36.1 points per game. That is currently the 8th highest scoring average in league history. Only Wilt, Jordan, and Elgin Baylor have been able to average over 36 points for a season. And that was not just a one-year sample. In the following year, he averaged 34.3 points, which is the 16th highest average ever. Then in 2017, he led the league in assist. He knows how to fill up a box score. What he doesn't know is how to lead his team to the finals. Number 31, we have John Stockton. His career numbers are staggering. He's the all-time leader in assists and steals. He also played a huge role in the team success that the Utah Jazz had. In the 90s, the Jazz made the finals twice and reached the conference finals three other times. But here's my biggest concern with him. He was only selected to the All-NBA first team twice, and he only finished in the top 10 in MVP voting three times. The highest he's ever finished was seventh. So you can make the case that he was never considered a top five player. Number 30, we have Scottie Pippen. He is considered one of the greatest wing defenders ever. He made the All-NBA defensive team every single year of the 90s, including eight first team selections. There is no other player during the 90s that accomplished that. He was also one of the first players to play the point forward position. He became the blueprint for players like Grant Hill and LeBron James. He certainly benefited a lot from playing with Michael Jordan but the 1994 season proved how great he was when he led the Bulls to 55 wins and finished third in MVP voting. Number 29, we have Chris Paul. He's arguably the most efficient point guard ever. He's so accurate when it comes to scoring the ball and passing without committing many turnovers. Then on the defensive end, he led the league in steals six times, which is the most by any player. He ranks third all-time in steals and assists, and he's ninth all-time in career win shares. Although he's never won an MVP, his 2008 season is one of the greatest seasons from a point guard. And then he got some much-needed playoff success by leading the Suns to the finals in 2021. Number 28, we have Nikola Jokic. At the moment, he's the all-time leader in career box plus minus, second in PER, third in offensive rating, third in offensive box plus minus, fourth in win shares per 48 minutes, and six in triple doubles. Along with all of that, he has two MVPs and the legendary playoff run that he just had. That is an incredible resume. But here's the thing, he's only had a three year sample of true greatness. He didn't accomplish anything special before that. I have to see more before I put him over the next tier of players that had a whole career full of legendary moments. Number 27, we have Giannis Antetokounmpo. The case for him is simple. He has won two MVP awards. He's one of 13 players to win the MVP in back-to-back -back years. He's one of three players to win the MVP and the Defensive Player of the Year award in the same season. He had one of the greatest finals performances ever when he scored 50 points to win the title. And he's one of the most physically imposing players we have ever seen. It's only a matter of time before he enters the top 20 if he keeps this up. Number 26, we have David Robinson. The case for putting the Admiral this high is that he's the most statistically dominant center behind only Wilt and Kareem. He's second all time in career win shares per 48 minutes, fourth in career blocks per game, fifth in PER, 10th in Valley over replacement player rating, and 13th in win shares. In other words, he meant so much to the Spurs during his prime. He led them to four 50-win seasons and one 62-win season before Tim Duncan showed up. After his arrival, he adjusted his game accordingly, which allowed the Spurs to win two titles. Number 25, we have Isaiah Thomas. He is one of four players that have averaged over 20 points and 10 assists 
for three consecutive seasons, which allude to his great scoring and passing abilities. However, Isaiah did it for four straight years. He was more than capable of recording great numbers, but he decided to sacrifice all of that in order to lead his team to championships. And he had huge success. He beat Larry Bird in the Celtics in 1988. He nearly ended the Showtime Lakers run at their full strength in that same season, but they officially knocked them out in 1989. And he beat Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls three straight years. Try finding another player outside of the top 10 that beat more legendary players than Isaiah Thomas did. Number 24, we have Dwayne Wade. He was one of the most explosive two guards ever. In his prime, there was no one that could stay in front of him. Just as the Dallas Mavericks in the 2006 Finals, he averaged 34.7 points for the series. He is only the ninth player to average over 34 points in the Finals. Michael Jordan was able to top that twice, and Kobe never averaged that much. He also had one of the greatest individual seasons in 2009. This is only the third time that a player has averaged over 30 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2 steals in a season. And then when LeBron decided to take his talents to South Beach, he figured out how to take a back seat to him while still being effective. The heat culture that is famous today all started with this player. Number 23, we have Julius Irving. He started his NBA career very late after playing in the ABA for 5 years, but he made an impact immediately. Here's everything he accomplished in his 11 year NBA career. There were 8 seasons where the Sixers won 50 games or more, including 2 60 win seasons. They made 3 trips to the conference finals, 4 trips to the finals, he won a title, he won an MVP, and had 2 other top 3 finishes in MVP voting. He knew how to win while dazzling the fans with his never before seen moves. Number 22, we have Charles Barkley. While doing my research, I believe he was the first player to be described as a freight train. In his younger years, he was unstoppable in the open court. Although he was an undersized power forward, he was a dominant rebounder, an extremely efficient scorer in a very physical era. He ranks 5th all time in career offensive rebounds and 14th in career true shooting percentage. In 1990, he averaged 25.2 points on 60% shooting. He is only the third player to average over 25 points and 60% shooting for a season. He recorded the best numbers while playing with the Sixers, but he had the most success with the Suns. In his first year there, he led them to 62 wins, he won the MVP, and they reached the finals. Number 21, we have Kevin Garnett. He was a transcendent player. He was 7 feet tall with guard-like abilities who could post up inside and play almost anywhere on defense. There's a reason why he's one of four players that led the team in points, rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks for a season. In 2004, he had one of the best individual seasons. He's only one of four players to post a value over replacement player rating of 10 or higher. Then when he got traded to the Boston Celtics, he led them to 66 wins and they won the title in his first year there. Imagine what he could have done if he didn't play with a bad franchise during his prime. Number 20, we have Karl Malone. He's in the top 20 for his amazing career achievements. He's a two-time MVP winner. He's third all-time in career points, fourth in win shares in value over replacement player rating, and seventh in career rebounds. Only he, Kareem, and LeBron James have scored more than 35,000 points. He's also the only player to score over 2,000 points in a season for 11 consecutive years. Although he never won the title, he reached the postseason every year of his career. He is easily one of the most statistically dominant players ever. But at the same time, he didn't thrive in big moments when called upon to deliver. Number 19, we have Elgin Baylor. He was called the godfather of hang time, and he had the greatest variety of shots during his era. It's what allowed him to average 38.3 points in 1962 and then 34 points in 1963. He was also one of the game's best rebounders, despite only being listed at 6'5". He even ranks 9th in career rebounds per game. That played a big part in the Lakers reaching the finals 7 times. Although he never won the title, there were a total of 10 playoff series where he averaged over 30 points. 
The truth is, is that he was an exceptional playoff performer and the best player to never win a title. Number 18, we have John Havlicek. He is the best six man in league history, but he didn't play that role because he wasn't good enough to start. It was just all part of the Celtics winning strategy. He didn't always start the game, but he was always there to finish it. You know how everyone makes a big fuss about Jordan going 6-0 in the finals? Well, Hondo went 8-0. In the last two titles that Bill Russell won, Havlicek was their best player and their leading scorer in the regular season and playoffs. Once Russell retired, he was able to add two more titles. He also racked up over 25,000 points and 31 career triple doubles. He's still to this day one of the most versatile and greatest all-around players ever. Number 17, we have Dirk Nowitzki. He's one of the greatest offensive talents that paved the way for the shooting big man that is prominent today. He scored over 30,000 points, which is something that only five other players have accomplished. But his greatness goes beyond the scoring department. He ranks sixth all time in career offensive win shares, eighth in win shares, and ninth in value over replacement player rating. He led the Mavericks to 950 win seasons and 360 win seasons. And in 2011, he led Dallas to one of the most legendary playoff runs by defeating Kobe. Kevin Durant, LeBron James, and Dwayne Wade. Number 16, we have Moses Malone. He was called the chairman of the boards, and with good reason. He led the league in rebounds six times, and he's the all-time leader in career offensive rebounds. In fact, there was one season where he averaged 7.2 offensive rebounds per game. And he was a great scorer as well. In 1982, he averaged 31.1 points. He's also one of eight players to win at least three MVPs. The other seven players will be somewhere in the top 10. He was the most dominant player in the early 80s. He led the Houston Rockets to the finals in 1981. That is the only time a team reached the finals with a losing record. Then in 1983, he joined the Sixers and they went on to win the title while only losing one game in the playoffs. The NBA is fortunate that he wasn't in a more talented team earlier in his career. Number 15, we have Oscar Robertson. He is the original Mr. Triple Double, which is what he averaged in 1962. But this wasn't just a one year sample. There were six times where he averaged over 30 points and he led the league in assists six times. With a player like that, it's no wonder the Cincinnati Royals led the league in offensive efficiency for five straight years. He even won the MVP in 1964. He was the only player not named Bill Russell or Will Chamberlain to win the award between 1960 to 1968. Although he never had enough talent to win the title during the 60s, he was a floor general for one of the most dominant teams ever. This came in 1971 when the Milwaukee Bucks won the title. Number 14, we have Jerry West. He is Mr. Clutch for a reason. He's had so many legendary moments in the playoffs. Just to name one example. He won finals MVP in 1969, even though his team lost. That just speaks to how great of a playoff performer he was. Did you know that he averaged a record-breaking 46.3 points in the playoff series against the Baltimore Bullets in 1965? Or that he's the all-time leader in points scored in the finals? Although he never beat the Celtics, he averaged a combined 32.9 points on 48% shooting for the six times he faced them. In the year he did win the title, he led the Lakers to 69 wins and they won a record 33 games in a row. Number 13, we have Hakeem Olajuwon. If we strictly go by the eye test, I believe he's the greatest skilled big man. The numbers back that up as well. He's the all-time leader in blocks, he's 4th all-time in career defensive win shares, 9th in career steals, and 12th in career points. He's also the only player to win the MVP, Defensive Player of the Year award, and finals MVP in the same season. There are so many other records he's broken, but we get the picture. His greatest achievement is when he had back-to-back -back legendary title runs. In 1994, he became the only player to lead a title-winning team in points, rebounds, assists, blocks, and steals for the playoffs. And in 1995, they became the only team to win the title while being the underdog for every playoff series. Now the case against him is that he got bounced from the first round in four straight years and then he missed the playoffs the next year. 
The Rockets also only averaged about 45 wins per season for the 17 years he was there. Number 12, we have Kevin Durant. He has a strong argument to be known as the most versatile and efficient scorer ever. We're talking about a player that is the size of Kevin Garnett, but handles the ball like he's a point guard. As a defender, there's nothing you can really do. There have been 10 seasons where he's had a true shooting percentage of 62 while averaging over 25 points. No one has gone close to that record. Before he won those two titles with the Warriors, he led the OKC Thunder to 60 wins in 2013, and he had an historically great MVP season in 2014. There have also been three times where he led his team to produce the highest offensive rating for a single season. There's no question that he has so much value on offense to any team you put him in. Number 11, we have Steph Curry. Forget about him being the greatest shooter ever. That is undeniable. But more importantly, he revolutionized the game. The three-point shot has taken over the league, and it's all because of him. He's not only the all-time leader in three-pointers made, but he has four of the five records for the most three-pointers made in a season. In 2016, among the many records he broke, his 67 true shooting percentage is the all-time best for a league-leading score. Of course, that was the season when he led the Warriors to 73 wins. In fact, they went three straight seasons winning over 65 games. That has never been done before. And if you think he needs a super team to be dominant, he won two titles without a single top 75 player on the roster. I believe it's only a matter of time before he surpasses this player. Number 10, we have Tim Duncan. Someone has to be disrespected in this list, and this is where I'll probably be accused of committing blasphemy. I don't want to make it sound like I don't recognize his greatness. I believe he is a modern day Bill Russell. He's the only player to start on a championship winning team in three different decades. He won five titles and six finals appearances, and he reached the conference finals three other times. So for nearly half of his career, he led his team to the conference finals. He also resembles Bill Russell on the defensive end. He's the all-time leader in all defensive team selections. He's second in career defensive win shares behind Russell, and he's third in defensive rating. He is the greatest winner of the modern era. My only issue so he was never as physically imposing or dominant as the next nine players. Number nine, we have Shaquille O'Neal. Out of all the nicknames he has given himself, the one that describes him perfectly is MDE, most dominant ever. The combination of his size, strength, mobility, and skills remains without comparison. And unlike some of the other giants in league history, he was not afraid to impose his will over every poor soul that guarded him. For example, he's only the second player to win three consecutive finals MVPs and to have two final series averaging over 35 points. His 2000 MVP season remains one of the greatest ever. From 1994 to 2006, his teams never won fewer than 50 games and there were three seasons where they won over 60 games. If we're talking about players at their peak, you can say that there was no one better than Shaq. Number 8. We have Larry Bird. What he accomplished was historic. He and Bill Russell are the only players to have won three straight MVP awards. From 1980 to 1988, he led his team to at least the conference finals for eight of those nine seasons. That includes five trips to the finals and three titles. What happened in 1989? He suffered major injuries and the Celtics went 42 and 40. Then he comes back, he's nowhere near 100% and they go back up to 52 wins. That's just a small taste of how impactful he was to that team. The numbers that he would put up were fantastic. But what made him so special is that he loved to do the little things, the dirty work that made the difference between winning and losing. That's why they were so successful in the 80s. The only thing that's holding him back is the lack of longevity. Number seven, we have Kobe Bryant. Let's start with the records he holds. He's tied for the most all-defensive team selections. He has the second most all-NBA first team selections. He's fourth all-time in career points. And he's the only player to score at least 600 points in three consecutive postseasons. He played at a high level for over 15 years. And that level was up there with Michael Jordan. It's not just the numbers, but the nuances. 
It was his killer will and his legendary scoring ability that can be described as art. It's true that he benefited from playing with Shaq, but in 2001, they nearly became the only pair of teammates to average over 30 points in the playoffs. That is why they nearly went undefeated. After the Shaq era ended, he reached the finals three times and won two titles without a single teammate that is a top 50 player. Number six, we have Wilt Chamberlain. Here's the obvious case for Wilt. He holds 72 records. Some of his highlighted records are that he averaged 50.4 points in 1962. He's the all-time leader in rebounds. He's the only center to lead the league in assists. And of course, there was that one game where he scored 100 points. I believe he's the most statistically imposing player in all of sports. But the reason why he's not in my top five was his inability to perform at the same level when it really counted. I'm sure you've heard the stat line that Bill Russell beat him seven out of eight times in the playoffs. But did you know that from 1966 to 1969, Wolf's team had home court advantage and had the more talented team for those four years? Yet he still got beaten three times. If only he was more successful in the playoffs, then it would be a no-brainer to crown him the GOAT. Number five, we have Magic Johnson. He's the best floor general and the best showman the game has ever seen. What makes him such a beloved player was his brilliant passing skills. He had the ability to take your breath away without scoring a single point. That is what makes his performances so magical. But what makes him a top five player is his ability to raise his game in the playoffs. He has averaged over 12 assists in the finals six times. No other player has done it even once. He has the most triple doubles in playoff history. Then in the 1987 finals, there is no other player that has come even close to averaging over 26 points and 13 assists. And before his first retirement, the Lakers averaged 59.3 wins with him under center. That includes six 60-win seasons. That is why he's the greatest point guard of all time. Number four, we have Bill Russell. The case for him is very simple. He's the greatest winner and the most impactful defensive player of all time. That is the reason why he led the Celtics to 11 championships. It's not because they were loaded with talent. Their biggest strength was always their defense. That is all Russell's doing. There's a reason why his contemporaries voted him as the MVP five times. But what about his low scoring numbers? Well, he believed in everyone having a specific role on the team, and scoring was not his primary job. But he could score if he wanted to. If you don't believe me, check out the 1966 Finals when he averaged 23.6 points on 54% shooting. All he cared about was winning, and no one was better at that. Number three, we have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I believe he's the most accomplished player ever. He's an all-time leader in career win shares and offensive win shares. He won the most MVPs. He's second in career points. And he's third in career rebounds and blocks. Now check out all that he accomplished in the 70s alone. He won five MVPs. He won a title. He averaged over 30 points four times. He finished first in blocks twice. And he led the Bucs to three straight 61 seasons. He did so much in that decade alone. And then he went on to win five more titles in the 80s. That includes being the oldest player to win finals MVP at the age of 38. So why is he not even higher on this list? Well, there were two seasons in 1975 and 1976 where he failed to reach the playoffs. And he was in the middle of his prime. I believe that is too big of a blemish for a player to be considered the greatest ever. Number two, we have LeBron James. There's nothing else for him to accomplish because he's done it all. There are too many numbers to rattle off to make the case for the next two players. Their greatness is undeniable. In LeBron's case, he has been a freak of nature since the moment he arrived in the NBA, and he's still going strong. There are no weaknesses to his game. He's a legendary playoff performer. He brought a championship to every team he's played for. I have no original thought to give to this player because everything has been said already. But here's why I don't have him number one. I believe Jordan's prime was better. I believe Jordan performed better in the playoffs. 
and I believe LeBron's biggest failure outweighs Jordan's by a mile. I believe for a player to be crowned the greatest of all time, your career needs to have as few blemishes as possible. Understandably, no one's career was perfect. Everyone had their failures. But some mistakes are bigger than others. And Jordan never underperformed quite like LeBron did in the 2010 and 2011 playoffs. Number one, we have Michael Jordan. It's the combination of his individual greatness, his big time performances in the playoffs, and his ability to carry his team to greatness year after year. He might not have compiled a bunch of stats, but the numbers say that no one had a higher peak than MJ. Whether it's recording the highest points per game, win shares, and value over replacement player rating for a single season in the modern NBA, or recording the highest points per game average for a final series, or recording the highest assists per game average for the finals by any player not named Magic Johnson, or leading his team to 72 wins and winning the title, or being the only player to win the scoring title, MVP, and Defensive Player of the Year award in the same season. The list goes on and on. All this time later, we still haven't seen anything better. Thanks for sticking around for this video. I look forward to seeing everyone's rankings in the comment section. Till next time.